Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful that you're joining us today again. Today, my mom is with me and my, my wife, Nancy. So it's really a pleasure to have you joining us via Facebook Live. Today, again, it's a beautiful spring, sunny day outside. We had a downpour, not last night, but the night before it just poured. Nancy and I went for a walk and about halfway through our walk, it started to rain. And by the time we got back, it was pretty good. And within 10 minutes, it was just drenching us. I love those that that first moment when it rains and that smell of rain on the on the pavement. I hope you're all doing well, that you're staying safe. I know there's a lot of different opinion out there right now. And sometimes it's difficult to wade through those opinions to know what is fact and what is truth and what is mere opinion and falsehood. And so we can pray for discernment every day. God, today, give me discernment. Give me your spirit. Give me the mind of Christ. Let me understand things from your perspective. So let's pray today. Kind and gracious Father, I just uh, thank you that as the oceans cover the earth, so your love covers us. I thank you that you know us intimately, Lord. Lord. That while we were yet in our mother's womb, you knit us together. You gave us our unique DNA. You brought us into this world, knowing us from before the foundation of the world. Knowing that you had purpose, grace for us from before creation even began. Where can I go from your spirit? If I go to the depths of the sea, you are there. There's nowhere where we can hide from you. And when we know your kind heart, Lord, not that we would want to ever hide from you. Father, again, I pray for discernment today. I keep hearing so many different opinions and maligning other people and maligning other sides. Father, I, help, I pray that you would help us to remember that for those of us who have believed in Jesus, we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. This earth is not our home. We are but wayfarers on the way. Help us to be Christians first, citizens of heaven first. Why do we entangle ourselves in the affairs of the world? You've called us to a purpose, and that is to share your name, to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the power of your grace today in our lives that transforming power of the Holy Spirit who is changing us from one degree of glory to another into the likeness of Jesus. And I thank you that that transformation comes from your spirit and not from ourselves. So even in the midst of this pandemic, as time is dragging on and was, as we're antsy to get back to normal life, I pray that you would continue your good work and I thank you that you are continuing your good work, that good work of transformation in our life. May we be light and salt in this world, Lord. I thank you for your presence with us, that you are Emmanuel, God, with us. Sometimes heaven seems steeled over. You seem silent, God. But in spite of those feelings on our behalf, you never leave us nor forsake us. Even now, as my words pass by our ears, you are here with us, abiding with us, providing for us, protecting us, loving us, giving us peace that passes all understanding, giving us your joy, the joy of the Lord, having already rooted and grounded us 
in Christ Jesus and now building our, us up as a holy temple and strengthening us each day in our trust, in our walk with you. And our only response, Lord, is just to overflow with thanksgiving. I was talking to my friend Doug Olson today who suggested we take just a moment and wherever you're sitting to look around the room or around the yard and to count all the things that he has blessed you with just in this room. And right off of the bat, I look up and I see my wife and my mom and I've been blessed, Lord. I've been blessed with a laptop and a, that's um, able to do this broadcast each day. I'm ble blessed with health right now. I'm blessed with a warm, warm home filled with those who love me and who I love in return. I'm blessed with two wonderful daughters. I'm bless blessed with a coffee mug full of coffee and a glass full of sweet tea. Thank you, Lord, for giving us such blessing in our life. But beyond that, we know that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, according to Ephesians chapter 1. That boggles my mind, Lord. I don't understand that, except for those blessings are revealed throughout the scriptures, especially in the documents of the New Covenant. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us so that we may know the things by which we have been graced the freely given things. So, Father, today I ask the Holy Spirit would open our eyes wide and wider and wider to the things by which we have been graced. Put away this negativity in us, the always looking through the eyes of the what-ifs, the if-onlys, the could-have-beens, and the should-have-beens. Get our eyes off ourself. Reveal to us the things by which we've been graced. And Father, in return, we give you thanks. My words fail here, Lord. What words can capture the gratitude we have for what you did, for what your son did for us on the cross, in the 39 lashes, in the taunting, in the being spat upon, being mocked, and then nailed to a cross. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your instruction. You're pouring out the love of God in our hearts for the fruit of the Spirit, for the gifts of the Spirit, for leading us and bringing us to walk in the Spirit. Father, once again, I pray that you would teach us to walk in the Spirit and to be led of the Spirit, and that you would fill each of us with an extraordinary measure of your Spirit today, extraordinary measure of the power of your grace in our life. We are wholly dependent on you for every part of our life. Bring us through this pandemic. I pray your will would be done. Simply, your will would be done through this pandemic. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining my family and I here. I've been enjoying doing the Psalms. Tomorrow I'm going to take the day off just to get some rest. Tonight it's, it's a lot of work putting these together, and I really have enjoyed digging in. Next week I'm going to cut back to two, two Psalms a week. Just on Wednesdays and Thursdays, I was finding that I was spending most of my day off on Monday preparing for Tuesday. So I need to take a rest. And I've decided not to go on Friday because not this next week, but the week following that, I'm going to be starting up our Thursday evening Bible study via Zoom. And if you'd like to join us, everyone's welcome to join us. We're looking at the discipleship of grace. And we're currently designing and putting together the chapters on the descent of man it's unit three 
of this discipleship Bible study that we're creating together. I'm writing it, and then the group corrects me. If I have something wrong, they're very good about saying, no, you need to rethink that grant. So I really appreciate all of those who have been helping me on this. And we're going to make that public on online just for free, whoever wants to use it. So pray for me. I have writing to do. I have editing to do. Editing of sermons to do. I have so much on my plate, and I feel like so little time. Isn't God good? So let's read our psalm today. It's Psalm 25. Again, it's a psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not, do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who dealt treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lo lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not, do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. For I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. So we look at Psalm 25. It's a very difficult psalm in, in many ways. It's again attributed to David. It's a song of lament where David is wailing to God about asking him to rescue him in the midst of his many troubles. Some think that this has been written over and against the story of Absalom when his own son comes after him, turns the hearts of Israel against David, and then pursues David literally out of Jerusalem. We don't know because it's not told to us. It may very well be. David had a lot of trouble in his life. I encourage you to read First and Second Samuel. First Samuel is about Saul, but then it gets into David and David's interaction with Saul and then into Samuel, Second Samuel that has to do with the life of David and Solomon. Wonderful read. Just as good as any novel. I, I love reading those old accounts or those accounts of the events of our patriarchs, of our forefathers in the faith. This is a, a hard psalm in the sense that it's hard to, how do I say it? categorize or organize. It just seems like a whole bunch of thoughts running through it. And part of the reason why, it's it's one of the acrostic psalms. And so we have acrostics. A lot of pre preachers like to use acrostics where you like you, you use five R's and you have repentance. Uh, I re don't remember all the five R's, but they're, they're a new, mnemonic 
tool so that we can memorize things easier by using the acrostic? Well, this is one of the acrostic psalms. There's eight of them, nine and 10, which we saw were acrostic psalms. This one has 22 verses, and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So each letter starts with one letter of the Hebrew alphabet, starting with Aleph or Aleph, then Beta, beta and so on, Gimel, all the way down to the Hebrew alphabet. There are two places where it, it departs from that pure acrostic, but it is an acrostic, and so David found words to match those letters, and therefore it's somewhat stilted by that. But it's also another chiastic structure. And this is a very long psalm. It's 22 verses. It's not the longest, but it, it is a long psalm. And so I looked at the chiasm, and I decided I'm not going to even try to attempt the chiasm because this is it. I have a program that shows you the structures of just about every passage in, in the Bible, and this shows you the structure of Psalm 25. It's a grand chiasm from verse 1 through the end, and it's very difficult to put together, and I'm not sure how much we would get out of it because it's not in the Hebrew language, and a lot of this was based on word plays in the Hebrew language and so on, so we won't see the parallels, parallelism between the first part of a chiasm. A chiastic structure was a structure they use within oral cultures. You went in a1, A2, A, or A1, B1, C1, D1, until you got the center of the psalm, and that pair at the center was the thing that you wanted the, the hearers of your psalm to focus on, or whatever it was. And then you would retreat back out from like E1, D1 backwards out, and there was parallels between the A1 and the uh, A2, the B1 and the B2, and so on. So this is that across that chiasm and it make it between those two things that it's an acrostic psalm and that it's this grand chiasm it makes it a difficult psalm so let's dig in i'm not going to do it verse by verse just because of the length of it and also um i think there's um another approach to this psalm that undergirds this psalm it's an understanding that comes from the language of this psalm that is heralding back to other things that were far be before David's life. And those truths, those events and stories, are what is the found, they are the foundation of this psalm. And so I would like to take, take a look at those foundations. So we begin, to you, Lord, I lift up my soul. We know that that same language was used, I think, in Psalm 24, to, to lift their souls to idols, to falsehood. Well, this is now David saying, I lift my soul to, to God. Oh, my God, in you I trust. So again, we come back to this foundational concept of trust. Do not let me be ashamed. For David, if God didn't show up, he had put his trust in him. If God didn't show up and answer David's prayers, then his enemies would exult over him. Do not let my enemies exult over me. And David would be ashamed. Would, And shame is that reality of when other people see the anguish of your heart or the failure, your failure. And in this part, David would be saying that it's God's failure, but David would be ashamed because his enemies exult over him. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. I find a principle herein that is remarkable. This idea of waiting on God. We are the microwave generation we like things instantaneous. Microwave popcorn takes way too long. It takes all of three minutes. It used to be like a 15-minute you know, process to make popcorn. You'd put oil in the, in the pot. You would put your popcorn in. You would heat up the burner, and you would slide it on the burner. You can't do that anymore on a glass top. It'll destroy your glass top. And then once it was popped, you'd have to melt the butter and pour, pour over it. And, and now we get microwave popcorn that takes, what, three minutes. We're not used to waiting. Everything is instantaneous, fast food, instantaneous information on our phones, the, the fount of all knowledge, Google. In Isaiah it says, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. 
they will walk and not be faint. Those who wait on the Lord, sometimes this wait can take a long time. I've been waiting on the Lord here at Grace Covenant for 24 years now. God never is in a hurry. What is it that God is calling you to wait on right now in your life? When we wait on him, we exchange our strength. We exchange our weakness for his strength. That's the meaning of that, those verses in Isaiah 40 that I, I quoted. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed because, God, you will bring them to shame. Then we get into the second section of the psalm. Some people say this is a section of meditation, but I find requests and meditation in here. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. So throughout this psalm is this request to be taught of God, to be shown his, the paths, the way in which he would have us go. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Again, that emphasis on truth and being taught of the Lord. These are wonderful prayers for us, even now in the midst of this pandemic, to be asking, let me know your ways, teach me your paths, Lord, even through this pandemic. Lead me in your truth amidst all this confusion and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. Whatever predicament David is in, he's not talking just about eternal salvation here. He's talking about deliverance from the persecution of his enemies. This word salvation always has a literal and figurative meaning. The literal meaning is deliverance from persecution, deliverance from illness, deliverance from tribulation, deliverance from hardship. And then the, the figurative meaning is eternal salvation, being delivered from our sin, from the enemy, from death, from the consequences of our sin. For you, I wait all the day long. Here's that emphasis on waiting again, waiting upon the Lord. Remember me, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness. Compassion, we see that in the life of Jesus. Ten times in the New Testament, we're told that, well, actually eight times, it's Jesus is moved with compassion when he sees the sheep without a shepherd, when he sees the woman coming out of Nain, when he sees the leper who is asking him to heal him. If you wanted to heal me, Jesus, you could. And Jesus says, Moved with compassion, he says, yes, I want to heal you. For they have been up from of old, these things, compassion and loving kindness. We're going to get back to those. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. So now we start seeing these words, compassion, loving kindness, my transgressions, sins of my youth. According to your loving kindness, remember me. That word loving kindness is, is hesed. It's the word for covenant, long-suffering love. It's a love that God has committed to him to committed himself to when he has covenanted with pe with a people. He had covenanted with the Hebrew people and so he had promised his long-suffering love for them. And in the new covenant he has covenanted with Jesus and Jesus is our human representative. And he has promised his long-suffering covenant love to us as well in and through Jesus Christ. So according to your loving kindness, remember me. Don't forget me, Lord. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Now here's another word. So we have compassion, loving kindness, transgressions, sins. Again, loving kindness and goodness. Well, that foundational passage that these are based on, we've already looked at it in one of the other Psalms some, some time ago. But it's found in Exodus chapter 32 through 34. It begins in chapter 32 where Moses is coming down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments on, engraved on the letters of stone, on the, on the tablets of the testimony of the covenant. And as he's coming down the mountain, he hears this wild party going on. The Israelites are worshiping a golden calf because they thought he's lost his life on the mountain. So he, they've asked Aaron to fashion an idol for them. Aaron has asked them for their gold trinkets and earrings and so on, and so they've given him his gold, and Aaron must have been a master craftsman because he has actually created this golden calf. When Moses confronts it about him later, he says, well, I, it just popped out of the fire. He doesn't even take credit for making it. But as Moses comes down, 
he hears the turmoil in the camp as they are reveling around this golden calf. Extreme sin in what they were doing. And as a result, 3,000 people lost their life that day at the giving of the law. And then Moses goes back up on the mountain. He stands in the gap in chapter 32. God wants to abandon the Israelites and start all over with Moses. And Moses says, what will the nations think of you? You've led us out of Egypt. You led us through the Red Sea. You bring us out into the desert only to abandon your people, Lord. And what is Yahweh doing but drawing Moses out into his priestly function to stand in the gap between this sinful people of Israel and the holiness of the Lord, of Yahweh. Moses, in that sense, is a type of Christ. He is our high priest who stands in the gap between us and our sin and our iniquity, that group sin, our family sin, and a holy God in that gap between us and a holy God. So then he asks, after he goes up back on the mountain, he asks God to show me your goodness, show me your glory, is what he asks. And that's where we pick up the story. Exodus 33, verses 18 through 20. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. That's an audacious prayer. Show me your splendor. Show me the highest thing I can know about you is to know somebody's glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And here we have over, on, over here, for, the, for your goodness sake, O Lord, I, may, I will make... My, all of my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord, Yahweh, before you. So he's going to proclaim his name and by proclaiming his name, he's going to reveal his goodness. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will, be, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. And so here we have a statement of the sovereignty of God. It makes us uncomfortable, but... These words are repeated in Romans chapter 9, if you want to look up that later. But God chooses who he will have compassion on and who he will show his graciousness towards. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and, and live. To, so to see God's glory is to see his face. And yet, because of our sin is the apparent reason, if we were to see his glory, the glory of his face, it would kill us. So, right after this, he tells Moses, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. And as I pass by, I will proclaim my name to you, but I will cover you with my hand. So you get God covering Moses with his hand. You have God putting Moses in the rock, and at the same time while he's covering Moses with his hand, the Lord passes by. And so you have the mystery of the Trinity wrapped up in this story. For your goodness sake, O Lord. So David is remembering this passage, the character of God, of who he is. And so in his prayer, he's remembering God's own self-revelation of who he is. And based on that, he can ask and expect even. He can wait on the Lord, make his requests, because he knows the character of God and how he will respond based on that character. Then we move on in the story. We get to the chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And this is where the Lord actually, he comes, Moses comes back up on the mountain with two new stone tablets, and God hides him in the cleft of the rock, and then he passes by. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So now over in Psalm 25, we see, remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness. What is David asking God to do? Remember who you are. 
in your very character, in that self-revelation of who you are that you gave to us, that you gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness. Remember that covenant love that we are in covenant with one another, that you have made an oath, that you have promised to be for us. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Remember your compassion to me. And obviously he has some sin in mind in his life that maybe he's attributing to the, the cause of his trouble to be associated with that sin. We don't know if that's true or not, but it seems to be that that's, what David, that's what's going on with David's thinking here. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, that long-suffering, stick to it of love. Never giving up. Even when in the new covenant, even when we've broken our end of the covenant, his loving kindness pursues us. He's promised to be for us. Does it give us a license to go out and break it? May it never be. For they have been from of old, your compassion and loving kindness. It predates even this passage in Exodus chapter 34. It goes back to the very character of God to before the foundations of the world, who he is in his very nature. He is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And it says, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. And here it says in Exodus 34, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. There we have those words. We're going to get iniquity later on in the, in the passage or before this. We have sins and transgressions named in Psalm 25. We have them named in, in Exodus 34. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, that meant thousands of generations, in contrast to the three and four generations that he will visit the iniquity upon the children and upon the grandchildren. He forgives iniquity transgression and sin. Iniquity is those family sins that we pass on from generation to generation, whether it's addiction or alcoholism or abuse or even sexual abuse or gossiping or lying or stealing or defrauding people or pride, that sin of family pride. Transgressions is to transgress the boundaries of the law. It's the same word we get tr trespass from, no trespassing. Don't go beyond this boundary. And then sin is the general word that means to miss the mark. It's a Hebrew word that was used in archery that meant that you miss the target. And we think of the target often as keeping the, the rules of the law. But the real target was to live in the radical and boundless and unconditional love of God. And Adam and Eve blew it. They walked out of that love, at least their knowledge of that love, when they chose to believe the serpent rather than God. So you'll see in these verses this, un, un, this foundational passage of the character of God. It does us well to familiarize ourselves, to meditate on this passage in, in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, to really know the heart of our God. He seems somewhat schizophrenic here because in the one hand, he's loving, he's all compassion and loving kindness and grace and truth, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin, and yet at the same time, he punishes, punishes the guilty, visiting their iniquity on the fathers, upon their children and upon their ch grandchildren, even to the third and fourth generations. That's a painful reality in our life to realize that a lot of the sins that our children walk in, they learned it from us just as we learned our sins from our parents. But as we saw when I last looked at this verse, Jesus meets every one of these characteristics of God when he gives up his life on the cross. He punishes the guilty in his own body. He is all compassion. He is all grace. He is truth in himself. I am the way and the truth and the life. And he visits the iniquity of all generations in his own body. He forgives all sin for the entire world 
in his own body. He keeps loving kindness for every generation that has ever lived. Do you get what this passage in Exodus 34 is? It's the Old Testament revelation given by God himself of what he's like, of what his character is, of what you can expect from him. So therefore you have, I will punish the guilty. David is saying, forgive me, forgive me. In the new covenant, this is completely lived out in our representative, our one representative, Jesus Christ. And then moving on. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your namesake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. There's that third word, iniquity. So you have all three words named in Exodus 34, named in these two sections of the psalm, sin, transgression, and iniquity. David's plea to be forgiven. Again, right at the top, good and upright is the Lord. Moses had asked in Exodus 33, now show me your glory. And God responded, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And so again, this foundational path, these foundational passages, this foundational event in, this, in the life of Israel is undergirding David's prayer and his psalm. And again, it says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. That loving kindness is that hesed, long-suffering love where God promises to love us to the bitter end. And you'll see the fourth line, third and fourth lines, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And here we have all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. So David's prayer, his psalm, his lament, is born out of knowing the character of God, knowing his kind but just heart. Doesn't that teach us in the midst of this pandemic that we can pray out of the character of God, knowing his kind and just heart? So in his kindness, I pray, bring this pandemic quickly to an end. But knowing his justice, Lord, do your good work in us no matter what it takes. I've been praying that for one for years for our nation. Do whatever it takes to bring us to our knees that we might return to you and turn our hearts towards home. We want this to be over as quickly as possible. That's not my thought. I don't want this to be over until the Lord's work is done. Seems a strange thing to say. We want to just get back to life as, as normal. Is that what we really want, is to get back to, to the life of our nation, lived in such sin that judgment will surely be coming? Do you realize that God has a threshold of sin that he puts up with in nations? You had the the Ammonites or the Amorites, I think, I don't remember which, but as Jacob is going down into Egypt, he asks God if he wants them to destroy the Ammonites, or I don't remember which it was, and God says, no, for their sins have not yet been made full. And then 400 years later, as Moses and the people are coming out, God commands them to destroy this, this population. Their sins had reached their threshold. Every nation has a threshold of sin that God will, I don't want to say tolerate. It's his grace and his kindness to us. You think about Nazi Germany. They filled up that threshold so quickly, they only lasted about 10 years. How full is our cup in our nation? How close are we to the threshold of reaching the, the breaking point where God will just put our nation away. Oh Lord, use this pandemic in our lives to bring us away from the brink. Show us your loving kindness and your mercy and your truth. Teach us, O oh Lord. 
Teach us as a nation your loving kindness. Show us the paths that we should walk in. Let us return to those paths. To those who keep his covenant and his testimonies for his name's sake, O Lord, O Yahweh. And here we have in Exodus 34, Then the Lord, Yahweh, passed by in front of him and proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord God, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. That's a prayer for us. Pardon our iniquity as a nation. Pardon our transgressions, our sins as a nation, and personally as well. But in the rally of the new covenant, all of our sins have been already forgiven at the cross. We still confess to restore the fellowship from our side. Read 1 John 1, 9 in its context. Don't take it out of context. We have these one-verse theologies we come up with. Navigators helped us set us up for that one because we learned 1 John 1, 9 out of the context of chapter 1 of 1 John. I challenge you, go home and read the context and see if you can put it back into its context. I won't do that today, but we move on and it says, Who is the man who fears the Lord, who, have, who has this awestruck reverential fear for Yahweh? Yahweh will instruct this man in the way he should choose. So Yahweh, God, instructs us in the way that we should choose in the paths ahead of us. I once had an argument with a fellow missionary out in Japan. He believed that God just left us free to choose whatever we wanted. And I was saying, no, God has a set course for us, set before us, as from Hebrews. And maybe both of us were a little bit right. I don't know. But here it says he will instruct us in the way that we should choose. Even in, the, in this pandemic, will he give us instruction on, on what course to take? when to reopen our churches, when to get back together again. This person who fear, fears the Lord will abide in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. That physical promise to Abraham and his descendants that they will inherit the land upon which Abraham, as far as Abraham could see, God gave him that land. We have a greater inheritance. Our inheritance is the Lord himself and eternal life. and the hope of living with him forever in the very dwelling place of God, in paradise, in heaven. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. So here we have again that undergirding language of covenant. So we have the passages from Exodus 33 and 34. And then here we have the language of covenant now used twice. This is the second time it's brought up covenant. And so I just want to explain to you what a covenant was. It was an ancient practice between two parties, between two people groups. It could be between two neighboring tribes. One tribe might be really, really strong and war warlike. Nobody can defeat them, but they're really lousy at growing food and because they're always about battling people. The neighboring tribe is very good at growing food and raising livestock, but aren't very good at being soldiers, so they're always being run, overrun, their flocks stolen, their food supply stolen. And so these two neighbors come together and they decide, let's make a covenant where for the tribe growing the, the crops, we'll say, you will be our strength. And for the tribe that is the warlike tribe, saying to the other tribe, you will be our provision. You will supply us with food. And they would have one representative from both groups, from both tribes, meet together. And those two would cut a covenant. And in both representatives would be the entire tribe in that one person. They were just a representative of the one of the entire tribe. And then what they would do is they'd take an animal and, and slaughter it, split it right down its spine into two halves and lay the halves apart from each other. And then as the two parties, these rep covenant representatives, these sometimes are called federal heads or federal representatives, but covenant representatives, they would pass through in a figure eight the pieces. And what they were saying was this, if I break this covenant, let it be done to me as has been done to this animal. 
And then as they were passing through these, this wall of blood, because it was cut in blood, then they would, it required a death. It was that, that solemn of a promise. We are making this promise in blood. They would also recite the terms of the covenant, which would be the agreement. We're going to supply food for you. You're going to be our protection, whatever it was. They would recite the terms of the covenant. And they would also recite the blessings and curses of the covenant. So if you we keep this covenant, these are the blessings. This is what we'll do for you, and this is what you'll do for us, and vice versa. And the curses of the covenant. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. First 14 verses of Deuteronomy chapter 27 are the blessings of the covenant of Abraham and Moses. It, it was rolled out over a long period of time. They are the curses or the, the blessings of the covenant that God has made with the people of Israel. There's 14 verses of blessings. From verse 15 to the end of chapter 27 and all of cha chapter 28 are the curses of the covenant. And I think there are over 60 to 70 verses, if I remember. It's horrendous reading. I'd encourage you to go home. If you want to live under the law, realize you're putting yourself under the blessings if you keep it, and you're putting yourself under the curses if you don't keep it. You do not want to be under the curses of the law. Trust me. So they would make these, recite the blessings and curses. And then once they had passed through the pieces and made this Solomon, Solomon declar declaration, that's where we get the handshake from, because the handshake originated with, they would make a cut in their palms and they would join their hands together and intermingle their blood to say that we are now one blood, we are one family. You have now become family to me, and I will look out for you as if you were born of my mother's womb or my mother's loins. And so there is this, that, that's what, where our word friendship comes from, is making a covenant. Friends were people who were in covenant with, with one another with one another. You were saying, I will be entirely and wholly trustworthy to you, and vice versa. And then they would oftentimes pour ash into the wound, or uh, ash, and that would make a scar, so that if anyone came against these people who were good at growing food to steal their food, they would see that scar and remember, oh man, they're in, they're in covenant with that warlike group down the that warlike tribe down the road we're not going to mess with them and when the warlike group were running out of food they would see their the scar in their own hand and remember that other tribe is going to provide for us they would often have a meal afterwards called a memorial meal and we see this in the passover as a memorial meal of the israelite people of their covenant and they're being brought out of Israel, or I mean out of Egypt, the captivity in Egypt. But there's also the memorial meal of communion. It's a memorial covenant meal. This cup is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. And lastly, oftentimes they would set up a, a memorial, a pile of stones. We see that throughout the Hebrew scriptures where people would make a covenant and they would set up a pile of stones to remember the covenant, maybe on the boundary line of the two tribes, so that when they came upon it, they would be reminded, oh yeah, I'm in covenant with them. So that describes the human covenant, but God, it's, it appears that God gave humankind this ability to make covenants. It doesn't mean to us almost anything to us. Contracts are broken frequently now. A person's word doesn't mean a thing. Even marriage, the closest thing we have to a covenant is what we proclaim in marriage, our vows. Those were the terms of the covenant. I promised my wife I would love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Tall order, and I'm not very good at keeping it. The only way I can keep those words is by Christ living in me. His loving kindness, his compassion, his love in and through me for my wife where I love her when she's good and when I love her when she's naughty. So, God entered into covenant with Abraham, and we see that in Genesis 15. And this covenant was rolled out over a period of 430 years. It begins with Abraham and is finalized with Moses in, in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is basically the book of the covenant explaining the terms of the covenant. You find those in chapter 20, 
the, the Ten Commandments and, and the other laws that are associated with that. You find the curses and blessings in chapter 27 and 28. The expectations of what will happen if you keep it, what will happen if you break it. Well, that covenant was made in Genesis chapter 15. And the promise of the new covenant was also there, heralded in that covenant. I'm not going to read that whole passage. I'd encourage you, if you have time, read Genesis chapter 15. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Right at the moment when God is ready to make a covenant with David, I mean with Ab Abram, he puts him to sleep. I love it. It came about when the sun had set, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a fl flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. They had just sacrificed the animals, put the halves, so there was this wall of blood, put the halves up opposite each other. And now you have this mystery of a flaming, a smoking oven and a flaming torch, making covenant, passing through the pieces. Some people think that the smoking oven has to do with their 400 years of anguish in Egypt. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Well, that passing through the pieces isn't the covenant he made with Abram. That follows, and it's a covenant of circumcision. You realize that circumcision wasn't introduced with Moses. It was introduced with Abram. And that covenant of circumcision was carried through the 400 years of exile in Egypt. And Moses, you remember, he hadn't been circumcised and God was going to kill him. After he calls him to deliver him, the people, his people from Israel, I mean from Egypt. And Zipporah, his wife, circumcises Moses so that God won't kill him. And then at the giving of the law, we, we get the terms of the covenant and the blessings and the, and the curses and the memorial meal, and so on. You have all these pieces. God will be our shield, our strength. That's all covenant language. He will be our strong tower. He is our great reward. All covenant language. But this, this mystery here, what is this about a smoking oven and a flaming torch? I looked up smoke, smoking oven, and nowhere else in the, New Test, in, the old, in the Hebrew Scriptures does smoking oven come up except for one time, it's, it's not the same exact language. The first word's the same. It's a smoking furnace. And it's when God descends on Mount Sinai like a smoking furnace. So we know that, reasonably argued, that this smoking oven, the smoking furnace, is Yahweh, it's God. But then who is the flaming torch? Nowhere in the Old Testament does it talk about a flaming torch in the Hebrew Scriptures until Jesus comes along and he says, I am the light of the world. And we think of light as light bulbs or the light of the sun. But when Jesus said those very words, he was standing in the, in the courtyard, in the temple, where there would have been the great menorah, the great candlesticks, 15 feet high, that were lit. And he says, I am the light of the world, standing beneath those very menorah lit. They weren't light bulbs, they were flaming torches, those menorah. So what I would suggest to you is that what the new covenant is about is we are too sinful and fickle to keep our end of the covenant. Abraham broke it, Isaac broke it, Jacob broke it miserably, the sons even did worse. And as we saw yesterday, there was this great descent into sin of humankind from Adam and Eve, that sin has tainted every generation, has tainted every human being, save Jesus Christ. And so what does God do? He sends his son, in the mystery of the Trinity, he sends his son in real bodily form. Jesus became flesh. He clothed himself with a human flesh. He became a human being, fully human and fully God. And now he goes and he cuts the covenant by the blood of his own body. He becomes that sacrifice of cutting the covenant. God the Father represents heaven. Jesus is our covenant representative. He is our federal head. We were in the creator. It says through Jesus all things were created in him. All things hold together. Where were you at the cross of Christ? Well, just as there is that I guess it's over here, that Japanese crane that I folded. 
that crane was in me before I folded it. Not the paper, but the idea of it. It was in me. And in the same way, where were you before you were born? You were in the heart of your creator who knew that one day he would knit you together while you were yet in your mother's womb. So when Jesus was hanging on the cross, we have this language of being in Christ, you were in Christ. When he stepped forth from the tomb, you were in Christ. When he ascended to the heavenlies, you were in Christ. So that Colossians says that we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ at the right hand of God. He has raised us with Jesus and seated, seated us in the heavenlies. So God the Father cuts the covenant in the body of Jesus with God the Son. God the Son will never fail to keep our end of the covenant. He keeps it on our behalf. Do you, do you get that? And he bore the curse of the law so that there's no more curse in the new covenant. The curse has all been borne by Jesus. There is only blessing. And what are we told? That we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. All that language of, if God is for us, then who can be against us? That's covenant language. And we start reading covenant language throughout the Old Testament. That he has poured out his love in our hearts. That hesed, compassionate love, his gracious love, his being for us. He will go to any extreme to protect us, even to, to the point of death where he forgives our iniquity, rebellion, and sin. The secret of the Lord is those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. That covenant is promised in, Jer is promised in Jeremiah 31, 31. Who are those who fear him? Who are those who reverence him? Simply those who obey him by believing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, by believing the gospel of grace, by believing the promise of life. Jesus said, as I pointed out yesterday, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, she who believes in me, shall not die. Even, let me start over. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And if you believe this, you come into his covenant. You come into that circle of blessing and protection. God being for us. His promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will be our shield, our strong tower, our great reward. My eyes are continually towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. So when you're in covenant with God, you don't have to look to yourself. He is the one who has promised for protection, for provision, for safety, for everything we need in life. Isn't this a message for being in the midst of the pandemic that we are of the covenant people of God and that he has made an oath to be for us, come what may. And then we close with these words, turn to me and be gracious to me. Again, that language from Exodus 34. For I am lonely and afflicted. Do you ever feel lonely and afflicted in the midst of this? The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Let's see, let me count my troubles. Stage four cancer, hernia surgery in November, hip replacement in January, I had odd side effects from it called, uh, whatever it was, band effect in my knee. Now the pandemic. The trouble of my heart are enlarged. And I'm sure the troubles of your heart are enlarged too. You can name them. Bring me out of my distresses. Lord, bring us out of the distresses of this pandemic. Look upon our affliction and our trouble and forgive us all our sins, not just individually, but corporately as a nation. Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and we're not talking about human enemies here. There are enemies as human beings, but I, in the New Covenant, we're talking about Satan and his cohorts. They hate us with violent hatred. Guard our souls and deliver us from evil, from the evil that is Satan. And don't let me be ashamed. Don't be silent. Show up, Lord. You've covenanted yourself. That's what David is getting at. He's calling on God. He's reminding God, you've made a covenant with us. You got to keep your end of the bargain. And we can do the same thing. In Jesus, you made a covenant with the people of the earth. 
all those who would entrust themselves in you. I have entered into that covenant through faith. Now you got to keep your end of the bargain, God. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. In the midst of this pandemic, where are you taking refuge? In Jesus? Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. He doesn't say my integrity or uprightness. It's the integrity which comes through grace, which Jesus fashions in us. Certainly in the new covenant, all integrity is the fruit of the Spirit. All integrity is a work of his transforming power in our life. For I wait for you. Three times now he's asked us to wait. In the middle of this pandemic, what are you being asked to do? Wait. Be patient. Wait. And I know if you try to do that out of your own flesh, you're going to blow it. So pray for the, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, patience. Patience is fruit of the Spirit. He produces it in us. For I wait for you. Redeem Israel. Redeem America, O God out of all her troubles. He says, out of all his troubles, referring to himself as king, as representative of the whole nation. What wonderful prayers for us. For I wait for you, redeem us, O Lord. Bring us out of this mess we're in. But bring our nation out of this mess we have created for ourselves by kicking God out of, out of schools, by kicking prayer out of schools, by kicking God out of marriage, by kicking God out of just about every part of our lives. Then his blessing is removed and we wonder why all this bad stuff is happening. For I wait for you. Let that be our words today. Lord, today we wait on you. And tomorrow, Lord, we wait on you. And the next day, Lord, we wait on you. Amen. Well, that's Psalm 25, and you see the foundational passages of the covenant of Abraham and Moses made with God, and that future covenant that was made between God the Father and God the Son, and then the underlying character of God revealed in Exodus 34. Underlying David's prayers, knowing God's heart, instructs and informs our prayer life. I encourage you to read these passages yourself. Genesis 15, Exodus 32 through 34. Learn the heart of God through that Hebrew revelation, that Old Testament revelation of God's very heart and character. Let's pray. Father, I just thought thank you for this day. I thank you for the richness of your psalms, this highly complicated psalm of acrostics for so they could easily memorize it of a chiastic structure that runs all the through the psalm with those center two verses it's not the center two verses but the center two clauses in it that are the heart of the psalm this undergirding reality of your very character that you are just and compassionate at the same time but in jesus that justice and compassion are married find complete resolution in the heart of God. Thank you for that we are living in a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the Spirit gives life. You have given us life, Lord. We give you praise. Teach us to wait on you today and tomorrow and the next day. So, Lord, this is our prayer. We wait on you. Hear our prayers, Lord. Deliver us from this affliction. And in the meantime, we wait. Well, again, thank you for joining me today. We won't be back tomorrow. Today is my birthday, so I don't want to spend the evening preparing for tomorrow. So I'm going to take tonight off, enjoy the day with my family. And we'll see you back on Sunday, continuing our study of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're hitting 16 through 20 now, verses 16 through 20, if you want to read ahead. We'll close with a blessing. A very short blessing. And I'll see you hopefully on Sunday. From Philemon 25. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.